Hello, art lovers. This is Gordy Grundy with ArtReportToday.com, your worldwide arts and culture news platform, along with the great Doppelhaus Press. Tonight marks the last of our artist discussions on the fascinating medium of fictive art. We'd like to welcome two highly accomplished artists, Nicholas Kahn and Richard Selznick. Our host today is Professor Antoinette Lafarge, an artist and writer with a special interest in speculative fiction and alternative histories. Today, we are here to discuss her new book, Sting in the Tail, Art, Hoax, and Provocation. Her many essays have been published internationally. Antoinette is also the author of another book about an incredible feminist of the last century titled Louise Brigham and the Early History of Sustainable Furniture Design. Antoinette is a professor of new media art at UC Irvine. Today, the author will be speaking with our two guests, artists Nicholas Kahn and Richard Selznick, who are featured in the book. Kahn of New York and Selznick in London have been collaborating since the 1980s. Together, they create fictitious histories, elaborate and curious tales of science and adventure set in the past and in the future which are documented with costumes, artifacts, photographs, and paintings. I think we are about to have a great deal of fun. Welcome everyone. Professor Lafarge, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Gordy, and welcome everybody uh, to today's talk. I've been following uh, Nicholas and Richard's work for a very long time, so I'm particularly happy that they're wrapping up this series of book talks for us. As usual, I'm going to start by giving a very brief um, overview of some of their work uh, with images so that you will have those images in your head while they talk about their work during our subsequent conversation. So I'm going to start by sharing my um, PowerPoint. And this should um, be shared, I believe, now. So uh, their work. Uh, the first work that I came across of theirs was the Circular River Project, the Siberian Expedition 1942-1944, which consisted primarily of these panoramic photographs, collaged photographs, and an expedition journal. It, it told uh, the story of a fictional 1944 expedition to rescue a downed British airman in Siberia. Um, and it actually followed on a slightly earlier project uh, around something called the Royal Excavation Corps. So it, there was this, this quality of um, slow expansion and growth that you often see in fictive art projects where a central idea takes multiple forms. I was very struck by how vivid these photographs were in conveying a, a sense of something happening somewhere very far away and the enormous care that was taken with location, costumes, props, and then, of course, also, here's another um, set f of images from the same project. Uh, the use of uh, sepia toning and uh, aging creases on the, uh, um, evident creases on the photographs, uh, the, what you see kind of archival seals in the top left, some of them also have annotations on them. All of this authenticating them as real photographs from a real moment in history, just one that we happen to have not known about, just as there are so many lost moments in history. Um, they have an unusual aura to me of being completely convincing in this historical sense and also very stagey, as if you know Hieronymus Bosch had somehow met the camera and decided that was going to be his medium. Um, they bring home how even if the event wasn't exactly as they described it in the journals, an expedition to Siberia in 1944, they convey this strong impression that something happened, something really unique and remarkable, and I always wish I could have been there myself when I look at a lot of their projects. Another thing, element of this project is uh, a fictive museum that they created, uh, modeled, I think, loosely on a real museum. They could perhaps speak to that the Novosibirsk Museum of Ethnography, and this is a sort of a classic ethnographic museum display of artifacts, uh, uh, cultural objects um, and that apparently related to the Siberian um, tribal culture which the British expedition um, met with. Uh, so the indigenes of Siberia. So there's um, 
a, a sense in which the project exists as the photographs and the journal, which was eventually um, produced for the public as a seven foot wide book, enormous, beautiful book. And then there are these other photographs, like the museum, which, which further work to secure the idea that this was all real. It happened there. Somewhere there's a museum with the artifacts of this very real expedition. A few years later, um, there came a story about, uh, from the project called Iceberg Freistadt, which is German for uh, Iceberg Free State. Um, it's a story about an iceberg that had sailed south from the Arctic and lodged off the North German town of Lübeck, creating a monumental tourist attraction um, that was designated um, as Iceberg Free State and became almost a city in itself. Um, for this project, the panoramas they created point um, to our Western romance with Arctic and polar exploration as the realm of the unknown. Again, the, the stuff that's hidden from us is brought forward in this fictional project. Um, while also hinting in several different ways at the effects of global warming. In the, one of the ex, uh, exhibitions uh, that I saw in New York, the Yancey, at Rancy Richardson Gallery, they exhibited not only the panoramas, which you see in the back left, and some other photographs, which you see in the back right, but the boat itself from this prior photograph, um, a real boat that, again, signals that there is a tremendous level of reality to this project that is not uh, that exists outside of the frame of art, almost a kind of um, autoethnography of fiction, you might say. Um, for this project, they also started producing um, a, a number of other kinds of materials that all testify to this iceberg moment in Lubeck in 1923. So here's a series of postcards, all kind of appropriate for their time and place. Um, they're stamped, they're addressed, and they have um, elements in them that suggest uh, the, the time and the moment of the iceberg. Um, so again, a display that's convincingly historical. Um, and then they also produce what I think is one of the most interesting elements of this project, the note gelder or, or pieces of money from that period, all of them commemorating Iceberg Freistadt. Now this was a time in the um, early Weimar Republic, after, we're after World War I, right, 1923, but still in, in the long run up to Nazism, when Germany went through a period of hyperinflation and money suddenly became worthless, people were carrying around wheelbarrows of money. It was a really tragic moment in German history with people spending millions and billions um, for a loaf of bread. And so there's um, the, all of these sort of commemorative bills are, are testimony to this, um, another catastrophic um, moment in history. Uh, that it points to the immediate catastrophe of hyperinflation and the impending uh, catastrophe of Nazism, which was still most of a decade away. Um, another project that is more recent than either of those uh, and has had taken a very wide variety of public forms is the Truppe Fledermaus, or Bat Troop um, project, which is a uh, imagined as a traveling cabaret from the 1930s um, that performs uh, often outdoors, has very elaborate um, props and costumes. Um, and that um, by focusing in this project more explicitly and overtly on theater, where you expect to see masks and props, um, all of the objects connected with the Truppe Fledermaus project end up with a kind of a double life. They are testimony evidence that this troupe really existed and had these costumes that were used in these kinds of performances in these places in the world. But they also exist simply as theatrical props, so you can accept them as having the fakiness of the stagey as well. Um, and that, that creates a kind of an, um, a reality frisson that I find um, very interesting in this project. Um, and of course, I don't know if they intended this, uh, but I think about, uh, they might have intended it. The bat is one of the animals that has become a kind of canary in the coal mine for climate change because of the enormous decimation of bat populations in, in the United States. I don't know if possibly around the world as well due to a, due to a specific disease that's 
um, taken off in some places. Um, again, for this project, they produced uh, ephemera, printed matter, um, in this case, posters uh, hearkening to, paying homage to the style of the period. Enormous number of posters. There are dozens and dozens of these really beautifully designed, convincing theatrical posters that, again, m make it easy for you to imagine that there was something that happened and you just happened not to be there because you were born a century too late. Um, so that's a feeling I, I get from a lot of their projects. I was just born too late, missed, missed out on whatever it was that happened in history that they have so carefully documented for us. Um, there, a number of, among the projects that are related um, more or less directly or loosely to the Trouvé Fledermaus are, the, are a couple of tarot decks that they have, they've done several beautiful decks and this is two of them, the Drowning Man tarot on the left, which I think they did a couple years ago, and the Carnival at the End of the World on the right. Now, I have really only touched here on a few of the projects that are most closely centered on the sort of fictive historicism that I'm particularly interested in, they've done a world of other projects that um, are not di as directly connected to what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. But um, I encourage you to go to their website. They have a very extensive and beautifully produced website that has extensive imagery from all their projects, uh, as well as uh, a shop where you can buy things like the tarot decks. So I strongly encourage uh, visits to their website. So I would like to turn now to talking with Nicholas and Richard. And um, you'll need to unmute, because I did temporarily mute you. Uh, and I think I'd like to start with a kind of an inevitable first question for a conversation like this, which is, um, what prompted the two of you who trained as photographers to start working in this area of partly fictional invented histories? I think, actually, you know, as soon as we uh, met in university, uh, we immediately um, started kind of uh, working together and kind of like doing research into, at that point, it was uh, stone circles and um, uh, standing stones. And uh, so we started building kind of uh, sets in our apartment of, uh, of standing stones and doing research about it. And we at that point, we weren't officially working together. We were kind of doing separate but very similar projects that we'd assist each other on. So it was kind of uh, right from right from the get-go of uh, working together. It immediately centered on this kind of notion of uh, world building and uh, coming up with... Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in uh, my memory, we were both obsessed with William Lake, his artist books he was doing where he was writing and creating uh, visual stuff and doing the thing of it. So both of us were kind of working off of a concept of a frame and a central image. And we were doing drawing, mixed in etchings, drawing, set building, uh, working historically in my, the project that I was working on senior year in college involved a antiquarian Scottish archeologist faking uh, a Pictish civilization around the year 900, trying to um, put archeological digs, he would create fictional archeological digs to bring up the, the, the hidden feminist side of the early Pictish Scottish history. So from get go, I was obsessed with forgeries of archaeology and the way that you could change history by altering history and historical artifacts, always making artifacts and then photographing them. Yeah, I think we're kind of you, you think the efforts on my I think we're kind of uh, using our artistic practice almost like a sort of time travel because uh, we both um, always had a lot of interests in different time periods. And so by kind of doing these uh, kind of quite theatrical projects uh, set in different eras we were interested in, it was a way of kind of, of actually managing to kind of inhabit that temporal space. 
let me just stay on this for a second because for a lot of photographers are very resistant to the idea of fakery. You know, there's this very widespread commitment to the documentary in photography. And there is a whole area of stage photography, often more on the commercial photography side. Did you get pushback from photographers as you, since you were talking about doing this in school, as to this idea of faking, even in, or yeah, you know, I, world building, make it okay? I would say yes, we did get, we got some minor pushback, uh, but even in a lot of the um, uh, historical photographs that we just assume are accurate or actually very staged as one that comes to mind are kind of Curtis's um, portraits of Native Americans where it looks like it's this, um, you know, it's from this time period before Europeans arrived. But in actual fact, uh, when you find out about it, sometimes he was having to kind of move his subject slightly to the side so that the gas station uh, wouldn't be in the picture and stuff like that. Uh, so there is a whole history of, of photography kind of not being quite what we think it is that intrigued us. Yeah, that's mm. very true. And then there's the Civil War battlefield fakeries as yeah. well. Yeah, also and also another one that comes to mind is uh, Robert Kappa's uh, portrait of the Spanish Civil War um, soldier be being shot, uh, which supposedly um, that didn't happen, that he actually, that he posed the guy. Um, but it's like this, you know, very iconic image from the Spanish Civil War. Um, a, li a little of um, my will to break the documentary tradition and fake it in our own realm was the fact that my dad was a cameraman in World War II in Europe and the family album was filled with snapshots of this incredible cataclysm that hit Europe and his stories were so exciting. And I lived this boring life in New Jersey suburbs for half the year and I wanted anything but that. And I wanted to build a sort of much more romantic time period of all sorts of adventures. And so seeing all those photos there with and, and the, the sense of this crumbling corners, dinged strange albums, each with a million stories coming out of each one of them, that sort of um, was early on a kind of an impulse to create our own albums and, and reuse his real historic photos and mix them with new ones that we were going to do. We, part of the, um, uh, side, was it the Siberian or the, the glider pilot one just before the circular river, we took, um, an album of photos that my father found on a dead German where he went off to Siberia in the end. Mm -hmm. um, and he was in Hitler youth camps. And I used to go through this album as a kid all the time. Um, and then taking, we took that and blew up the photos and then added our own group in and then wrote a new plot line for what was going on in the, from the original negatives that my father ga gathered during the war. So that mixing of, real material but false identification of what it was and then us shooting new stuff to match the kind of same character that we found in, in these photos it was all part of our earliest attempts at photography professionally yeah sometimes i almost see what we do is uh almost being like reenactments and i think where the fictive history comes in is that uh, is the thing that we're re reenacting, did that thing actually happen? And some of the times it, it has happened, some of the times it hasn't. Like, you know, you mentioned the, um, the iceberg. You know, some people were convinced that we'd done a whole reenactment of, uh, of the actual historical iceberg uh, that washed up. Uh, so yeah, so we, we try and that's the kind of line I'd say where we kind of like really try and blur. Is it real or is it not real? Yeah, because so reenactors don't really successfully blur. Everyone who goes to see a Civil War reenactment or a, you know, any other war reenactment knows that they're looking at something staged. It has the frame of art all the way around it. And it's, it interests me very much that you have presented this in ways that makes it very ambiguous to deliberately ambiguous to your audiences.
Yeah, we certainly, we like having that uh, ambiguity, but because uh, some of these projects are seen in art galleries, we sort of have an assumption that the kind of most people are going to figure that out at some point. Um, so then the question becomes, uh, what do you layer in there uh, beyond that? So in other words, if it's with the iceberg, someone might figure out, you know, oh, they made all this stuff. And so then the next level is, well, okay, they made all this stuff, but what, what did they base it on? So, so the idea is that we, that we try and kind of, uh, we try and create these things so that if, if our ideal audience member is like a detective, that they can really go in and get lost in the vagaries of, of what might be true, what might not be true. Uh, yeah. So for instance, the hyperinflation did happen, but the iceberg didn't. For instance. Yeah. On that subject, there was uh, uh, in my research on hyperinflation, and it partly comes from my dad brought back also from the war, some of those bills from the hyperinflation period. And he told me stories about uh, houses wallpapered in that. So I was always intrigued with this, this hyperinflation currency. So I started collecting and reading more about Notgeld. And then I noticed one of the artists who created it was this German artist named Wenzel Hoblich who was also a paper architect and created crystalline architecture along with this strange and magical early moment in German expressionist uh, architecture which was and painting that was some of my favorite art of all time. And so I started investigating this character and there was a museum to him near Lubeck that I could go to. I met his grandson. I got all sorts of paraphernalia from his life, these crystals he gave, the grandson gave me that were his from the 1920s from this guy who had done some of these banknotes as well as some spectacular expressionist architecture. And so then I was able to incorporate in the project real banknotes that are so fantastical and hard to believe were done and were done in such an adventurous artistic style that no one could possibly believe this all existed. And so we incorporated the character of Wenzel Hoblich, who was a real character, and shot our friends as Wenzel Hoblich, smoking the real pipe that Wenzel Hoblich's grandson gave me that appears in other authentic photos of Wenzel Hoblich in his portrait. So this blurring of real paraphernalia in the show from real people, but fictive photos and fictive stories, but partly real background was what we were really interested in letting that anyone who wants to try and piece piece apart our fiction, they'll find some of the most magical history you could find that really happened. Yeah, it's kind of, it's all about the blur. You, you, you know, it's kind of by design. It's, it's uh, you know, there's supposed to be a lot of artifice in it, uh, but that can kind of work both ways. That so sometimes you like have to go back and question what you thought was artifice might actually turn out to, uh, to be you know, to be real. Yeah, it really makes us question our assumptions of what, how much we actually know about something. Uh, I'm interested also in how, uh, how the story or the language of the story evolves with the images. Do they co-evolve? Does one usually move faster than the other? Do all of them end up with language being in it somewhere. I mean, I know, for example, with the Circular River, there's an entire or a lot of a journal. But I, in some of the later projects, I don't see the language or the story as foregrounded. Can you talk a little about how you those two circle around each other in different ways? Uh, yeah, sure. I'd say every project is intended to have um, to have both uh, text and image. Um, it can almost uh, not make any difference whether uh, we kind of conceptualize things using visual language or, or verbal language. It seems to kind of function the same way and seems to kind of uh, uh, generate kind of narrative and themes in the same way, probably because, um, you know, our brains are made in a certain way. So no matter how you stimulate it, the kind of the outputs are almost the same in a certain way. Uh, but some of them we've been quite specific with language right at the beginning. And then others, we let the kind of project generate the language. Uh, but for sure, uh, you know, text is always supposed to be a part of it. 
I, I enjoy trying to throw in a different physical medium in every project, a different format of camera uh, and shape of objects. Um, it's part of our world building is to kind of come up with new techniques and new variations and new ways that Richard and I collaborate. Um, so each, with each project, it's uh, always trying to top the last play with new new techniques, but and so some will be much more word heavy and others will be very object heavy and trying to tell it in a more silent film kind of way. Um, or something might use ceramics as, a, as one of the narrative vehicles. It just like as many possible ways that we can do this, we, we're trying. It's been a long history of us doing this. So we, we have to be inventive because we basically are keep telling the same story over and over in other ways. Yeah, I'd say that um, problem in one in a certain way, the best way to think of what we do is uh, almost as being like a film, but without the actual film. Uh, so you sort of have everything else. You've you've got kind of the script, the locations, uh, you know, the actors, um, but the final form of it takes this kind of a different form. Yeah, it's, it is very cinematic this work, and that brings me to something else I wanted to ask you with artists, um, the artists in, in this genre who work with performance aren't in the majority, but I'm very interested in how performance does figure into the work. Do you do a lot of improvising? Do you work very strictly with scripts? How does that play out? Yeah, that uh, really varies. Uh, sometimes we'll go out into the field with an extremely exact idea of what we're going to do and uh, what we need to do to accomplish that. Um, but then even, even when we do that, there'll be kind of time around that where things go a little haywire and we're always, uh, we're always shooting throughout whatever kind of unexpected things happen. Uh, but then other times we'll go out with, um, you know, either ourselves or with, uh, you know, friends or, or interns or whatever. And uh, we'll just see what happens. So it's kind of both, I, I'd say. We try and get not locked into, into one approach uh, so it doesn't get too predictable. Yeah, there's, there's uh, often it's certain types of props, uh, a certain costume, an idea. We have the rules of the world. Um, and then uh, we go out there and the tide is high and we start losing everything to the tide and a uh, tree is worth climbing because it's got the particularly gorgeous shape and we discover something. Um, and then we direct and, and, and see something, remember something from art history and tell our friend who's posing with us to do a certain thing or, or remind the other person. But, but we definitely go out there quite often with a little sketchbook, with little mini sketches and, the, and, and a firm idea. But then reality always gives us an adventure and we, we run with it. 